Hi, and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be discussing about the collisions and uh, and its effects and its, its types in one-dimensional motion as well as in two-dimensional motion. So, what is collision, basically? Well, we all know from the previous lectures, we've discussed that the momentum uh, doesn't change unless there is an external force that changes it. The momentum satisfies the law of inertia. So, uh, but collision is in a is a case uh, in which the momentum of the body changes abruptly, uh, okay, and instantaneously. So, for an example here, so what I do is I uh, say while playing cricket. Uh, so when you when the batsman hits the ball. Uh, the ball's momentum uh, changes yeah. to certain extent that the motion of the body, motion of the ball, is uh, most of the time reversed in the op or in a, the body travels in the opposite direction. Hence, the motion actually, uh, the direction of the motion gets reversed. So that's the you know uh, impact of collision. If we can uh, just uh, imagine that. So uh, we shall see about. Uh, you know the types of collisions and uh, and the forms of collisions and calculations of collision with, with respect to the momentum and uh, the change in the velocity and the and so on. So some other so uh, we'll be discussing about that and the impulses, of course, the impulse of a force and, and so on. So uh, of course, impulse of a force will be discussed in the coming chapters. In the in the in the, in the next chapter, we'll be discussing about the rotational uh, motion and in the next. Uh, in the second lecture from now, we'll be discussing about the forces and, and its impact and impulse and impulsive forces and so on. Uh, and we'll end uh, this Newtonian mechanics and we'll go to the uh, you know simple harmonic motion and then the thermodynamics and so on. So now, uh, so collisions occur all the time in the world. Now if I'm standing here on, on, on a patch of land and uh, you know all the time, every single second there are so many cosmic ray particles that are passing through my body, through the earth, there are like uh, you know every day there are about 100,000 meteors, you know small meteors that uh, collide with the earth's atmosphere. So collisions is, uh, are everywhere around us and all of them, most of them, 99% of the collisions are inelastic collisions. And um, But what we can do is we can approximate it to become a, a elastic collision. Oh, we shall discuss about the elastic collision later. For now we will discuss about the collision uh, when uh, one of the objects is stationary and the other object is moving. So this is called as a single collision. Uh, so in a single collision, again, one has to remember that the, the object that strikes is always called as the projectile and uh, here the ball bat example that we took I'll just draw the bag. I know it's very horrible. So, drawing is very horrible. Sorry about that. This is called as the target. Right? The ball in the back. And the ball is called as a projectile. And the target uh, is the bat. Right. Uh, let, let it be as such. From now, but for the previous lecture, we know that dp by dt is equal to f. Again, let's write it in terms of p. So dp is equal to f of p times dt. So, uh, so what do you do is uh, so uh, let's take some uh, time interval ti to tf. So what happens in the time interval Ti of Tf? So the net change in the momentum, this is the net change in the momentum with respect to time can be calculated by integrating it Ti Tf after the collision 
dp is equal to tf f of t times so this is nothing but the change in momentum delta p that's what it gives you and this is called as the impulse of the force uh, impulse of the force basically is nothing but the measure of force and the duration of the collision force so the force that I mean that we are measuring both the force as well as the duration in which the force acts on the body during the collision okay so so, so the right hand side gives you the impulse and this left hand side of the equation gives you the change in the momentum okay so um, so now what we shall do is we shall just uh, write for impulse. Impulse is J is equal to again P1 uh, Tf sorry Tf uh, F of T Tp and uh, what one can write is uh, since this is uh, nothing but change of momentum delta P is equal to P1 P F uh, F of T D T right which can be again written as P X P F minus P X I P I P F F of T D T so here this is uh, the rate of change of force with respect to time that means we are measuring the, uh, the change of force or the rate at which the force changes during the you know the period of collision most of the time this data is not available so what you do is you have another formula that is uh, you know, simple so j is nothing but the f average times delta t Right. So uh, again and again, I'm I'm just repeating. So a vector is uh, I mean impulse is a vector because it is a product of a vector force and uh, time. Unfortunately, time is a scalar in uh, the Newtonian physics. All right. So uh, J can be calculated with uh, uh, this formula. Very important without using differentiation at all. Here again you use the integral calculus and calculate. So these are very important equations that one uh, has to remember while while solving problems. Right? something pretty interesting at the end I have uh, a um, we know, we are, we'll be applying and calculating the acceleration and the velocity of a rocket you know where the mass changes at the end so we're discussing some rocket science here okay so brace yourself till then so uh, we've discussed that and uh, since I was you know the ball and the bat arrangement that I had done here you know, we were calculating on the ball, right? We were calculating the impulse on the ball. So how about the impulse on the bat? So impulse on the ball J B is equal to minus of J bat. So, so it's negative of the impulse that you get for the other object. So because the object here, uh, you know, after the collision, the object moves in the opposite direction and uh, hence the impulses are in terms of magnitude they are equal but according to Newton's third law of motion where we apply to this uh, you know the impulse of uh, is again impulse is a force right and so you know it, it's in the opposite direction thanks to the action reaction pair
So what we shall next discuss is that uh, what happens to a body if the body is collided one after the other, you know, just keep on pounding on someone. Uh, uh, keep throwing balls or here is a, a block at rest. This is the velocity. There are n number of balls. So again, this will be the projectile and uh, this will be the target. Right? So target is being pounded with projectiles one after the other after, sorry, n number of times. So uh, so the impulse will nothing but will be equal to n times delta P, right? So it is n times delta P because of the n times collision. So it is n times delta P. N is the number of projectiles again. Delta P is the total uh, change in the linear momentum. Um, you know, I've got this uh, delta P by considering the linear momentum in, the, in this axis, in the V axis, the horizontal axis. The component of the linear momentum along the horizontal axis is what is the delta P, the total change in the linear momentum along the axis. So, the next uh, formula that we have written is uh, J by delta P, right? J is equal to F average times delta P. That's what we had written. So, now two formulas that we have. Now, uh, simply substitute the first in the second and then uh, N times uh, delta M delta V by delta T. I do apologize for this minor mistake here. It is delta P. I have written it as delta P. So again, delta P here. Right? So here again, momentum, uh, I mean, mass can be taken as a, a full, I mean, like a uh, the total mass, and so we shall not write it as delta M as of now. Yes, uh, later on we shall substitute delta M. Now delta V here, uh, you know, is uh, is V2 or Vf minus Vi. So here V, uh, you know, in one case, uh, in one case number one, if the body strikes the block here and uh, well stopped, then that means that the final velocity of the body is zero. It comes to rest after the collision. When the final velocity is zero, then the delta V is nothing but VI. And now, in the second case, if both the velocities are equal, then uh, let's say it is minus 2V, right? Because now, after the collision, it moves in the opposite direction. So if you add up, then you get minus 2V. However, we are not substituting that here. Anyway, I just wanted to discuss about uh, how you take the signs of the velocities. Now, for delta m, delta m is n times m. So, n times m, masses of the balls colliding with the block. So, now we shall substitute delta m by delta t times delta v. So, F average is nothing but the rate at which the mass collides with the target times the ra rate at, I mean, uh, times the change in velocity. So the force average is equal to rate at which the mass changes uh, with the collision and uh, times delta V. So this gives an equation for series of collision, uh, the, the force for the series of collisions. Alright, so 
I think we're done with uh, the series of questions here. Uh, it's a very important formula. I'll calculate the force at which those uh, individual masses affect uh, the, the target. So you, you can just calculate that and later on find out the impulse and the impulse in the forces and so on. So from this very formula. So elastic collisions, we shall just uh, introduce uh, elastic collisions in one dimension right now. So what is an elastic collision? So elastic collision is uh, a collision in which the initial kinetic energy is equal to the, I mean initial kinetic energy in the sense kinetic energy before the collision is equal to the kinetic energy after the collision. So in such kind of uh, collisions, uh, uh, you know, you can term it as uh, elastic collision. So elastic collision is what we are discussing right now. Elastic collisions. So Ki, K before collision is equal to K after the collision. Or you can write it as Ke before the collision. So kinetic energy remains the same uh, even after the collision. So uh, in such cases it's called as the elastic collision. So now we shall see uh, elastic collisions in one dimension. Okay. So um, so uh, let's consider case number one where that where one body is moving with a velocity v i v i one of mass m one this is m two v i two is equal to zero so after the collision right after the collision the body Vm1 gets uh, Vmf and uh, the body M2 gets V2F right so these are the masses and the velocities so till here it's uh, before the collision and uh, here it's after the collision so BCAC BC means before collision, AC means after collision. So before collision, the mass 2, M2 is 0. I mean, that means it's, it's a, it is at rest. M1 is moving at V1, VI1 towards M2. After the collision, M1 becomes MIF because some of the energy, the kinetic energy is transferred to M2. Hence, the M2 moves at a velocity M2F uh, that is indicated uh, here. Okay, so this is. M to F, this is after collision and uh, that is before collision. So, uh, what you do is simply you equate the momentum here Mi V1I is equal to M1 V1F plus uh, M2 V2F. Okay? So, uh, so this is uh, the momentum formula. Here, it's nothing but the change of momentum is equal to M i plus M f. Sorry, P i plus P f. Delta P is equal to P i plus P f. That's what we are actually uh, writing. Since the collision is elastic, elastic um, half M i V i one squared is equal to half M one V i f squared plus half m2 v2 f squared because the collision is elastic uh, kinetic energies are equal before and after the collision so from these equations v i f 
the final velocity of mass m1 after the collision is m1 minus m2 by m1 plus m2 into vi1. So this is what is the final velocity of 1 uh, after uh, collision. So m1 minus m2 by m1 plus m2 into vi1. So final velocity of v2 is final velocity of v2 is uh, 2 m1 uh, 2 m2 by m1 minus m2 by vi1. Right. Okay, um, it is correct. Um, so, um, this will be the equation for this kind of example. However, uh, we shall take, we shall consider a variety of uh, you know, situations based on these uh, you know, stationary object. Uh, so if one object is moving and the other is at uh, rest initially, later on you know, because of the uh, transfer of kinetic energy, the other moves. The same, same problem will be continued, but we shall have different situations. So in the first situation, M2 here, massive M2. That means M2, mass M2 is much, much, much greater than M1. Then what happens to these equations? Uh, let these equations be here itself. 1 and 2, very, very important. So what happens if M2 is massive and uh, so the velocity Vif is equal to minus V I1. So, uh, so if the velo the final velocity of one is almost equal to the uh, the initial velocity of m1 before collision, but it is in opposite direction, hence the negative sign. So, v2f will be equal to 2m1 by m2 times v is v i v i 1 so um, so this is what uh, the v2 will be twice the mass of m1 by m2 times minus of v i1 right uh, yeah, plus of my okay plus minus plus this gets cancelled here mm. uh, direction is in motion of uh, sorry the direction is not negative the body moves uh, in the direction of the force acting so not negative again positive sorry for the confusion So now, what if both the masses are equal? Then the final velocity of V1 will be 0 and uh, the final velocity of V2 will be the initial velocity of V1. So if both the masses, both the masses is equal to M2, M1 is equal to M2, Vif is equal to 0, V2F is equal to Vi1. Right, so the equations, uh, it's the same thing here. Uh, put m1 and m2, zero in this equation, you get v zero into vi1 is zero. Here again, you put uh, 
M1 is equal to M2, 2M2 by 2M2, 2 to get, I mean you get this cancelled, all you are left with is VI1. So from this equation, if you put M, you know, substitute the values that you are taking in, it's easy. So what you all have to do is you have to remember only these two equations in order to find out uh, all the types of, uh, you know, all types of different values in one sense. So here, now again, what if M1 is greater than, much greater than M2? Then what happens? So M1 is overshadowed uh, by, uh, sorry, M2 is overshadowed by M1 in this case. So what exactly happens in this, in this case? So V1F is equal to V1, VI1. That means the the velocity of mass 1 uh, changes very, I mean, not too much change of kinetic energy or there is not much exchange of kinetic energy. Uh, so VIF after the collision is almost equal to VI1. So what about V2F? So V2F is 2VI1. So uh, the, the the mass 2 actually speeds up twice the initial velocity of the V, uh, sorry, of mass M1. So this is how it works. Little bit confusing, uh, but uh, I think we should be fine if we can remember these two important formulas. Uh, and uh, we can just substitute the values and get the required results that we want. So what if the target is moving towards uh, each other? So what will happen? For the equations. So if it's an elastic collision, again the kinetic energy has to be, uh, shall, shall not change. So VIF will be M2, M1 minus M2 by M1 plus M2 times VI1 plus 2M2 by M1 plus M2 times VI1 by V2 1. V I two V I two V this is I again this is V one I and so on. So the V two F will be equal to two M one by M one plus M two times V I one yes plus M2 minus M1 by M1 plus M2 times V2 y. So this is, uh, again these two equations are very very important and again you can you know, just solve based on which mass is greater and, and so on. So you get the values I've done for the previous one where uh, for a stationary object uh, but now you can, I think you can apply it on your own self and let you do that, uh, you know, where you can just uh, consider that here M1, this is M1, this is M2, what if M1 is greater than M2, much, much, much greater than M2, what if M1 is equal to M2 and what if, what if M2 is much, much, much greater than M1. So what are the equations, or what, are, what happens here? So uh, you, sh you can just put in these two equations, VIF and V2F, uh, V1F and V2F, and then uh, you can get the equations for respective uh, substitutions, or you know, just use a little bit of uh, you know, common sense while using M1 much much greater than, it has to be much much greater than that of M1. In this case, I mean in that case, you are going to apply it in the, in the problems, in problems 
it will be applied inside. Um, so that's the way it has to be has to be done. So I think we are coming. Uh, I think we can end up uh, by the collisions in one dimension. So we should focus on collisions in two dimensions. So when you colli when you focus on collisions in two dimensions, it's very necessary to know the relative motion, the relative velocities that we calculated in two dimensional motion. So uh, we're using the same. Uh, even in this um, collisions in two-dimensional motion. So for the collisions in two-dimensional motion, um, the system has to be closed and isolated and also the linear momentum, the momentum, uh, linear momentum must be conserved. Otherwise, the, you know, it doesn't hold good. The collision doesn't hold good. Again, but remember discussing, we are discussing elastic collisions. Uh, so, um, so basically, collisions in two dimensions, P i f plus uh, P two f I l P i for so you would apply one of the important things to consider is that uh, you know the momentum is uh, the momentum doesn't change And uh, since the momentum doesn't change, Ki what kinetic energy also does not. Sorry about this. Okay. So the kinetic energy also doesn't change. So now let us uh, consider uh, a, a a problem in one sense, or a or a or a equation or to derive an equation for an instant where uh, where m one here is mass m one uh, moving with velocity v i one after collision with m two. M2 goes there and M1 reaches here. So this is theta 1 and this is theta 2. Here is M1 and M2. Again, here M2. M2 initially is, uh, mm, well, it's not at 0. Again, they're both are moving. So V2I, so this is V2F. Again, this is because M2, this is M3, so V1F. So, what happens uh, to this? If you apply the laws of motion and uh, for the x axis, what you get is uh, MI VI, 1 VI is equal to M1. V1 F plus M1 V1 F since there is an angle here cos theta plus M2 V2 F cos theta and you might as well write it as theta 1 and theta 2 or uh, you know, let it let that be uh, sorry here this will be theta 1 or uh, theta is the same or and just uh, just in case if the theta is not equal, then um, then it's theta two m one v one f cos theta two plus m two v two f cos theta one. All right. So this is the x-axis. So y-axis no. momentum doesn't change here. So there is nothing but uh, m one v one f psi theta 2 plus uh, m2 v2 f sine theta 1.
So, so again, uh, applying the kinetic, I mean, since the kinetic energy shouldn't change, this equation can also be written as half m1 v1 squared, half m1 v1 squared, then you've got a half m1 v1 f squared plus half m2 v2 f squared. Right? So this gives, you can, so this is x axis, so this is y axis, and this is in terms of, of, of speed. Uh, this equation enables you to calculate, uh, you know, the final velocity or the kinetic energy, you whichever you're looking for, uh, most probably V1, uh, you can calculate, or V1F or V2F, you can calculate if you know the other formulas, okay? I think this uh, is what uh, is all about this. So you apply in the x-axis, you get m1 v1 vi is going to m1 v1 f cos theta 2 because uh, m well, m1 v1 f cos theta 2 because this is m1 here again, m1 ends up here m1 ends up there and uh, plus m2 v2 f cos theta 1. How did I get this equation? Uh, again, the question is, uh, you apply the momentum, linear momentum, The com this is the component of linear momentum along the x-axis, so this is what you get if you apply the uh, momentum that we have already discussed in the previous lecture, um, right? Part 3, momentum and, um, and center of mass. Again, the same thing, the momentum doesn't change in the y axis, the vertical component of the momentum remains constant. So again, the equation can be written as this. And uh, in terms of velocities, you can write it as half m1 v1 squared is equal to half m1 v1 f squared plus m half m2 v2 f squared. Right? Uh, but you know the sad part of these problems is uh, if we solve, I mean, like uh, still the last lecture, uh, momentum. Uh, you know the derivations that we did. I mean, of course, we did very little derivations in one sense, but uh, most of the derivations that we did had some historical background. The history of physics continues uh, with the uh, derivations, so it was very necessary for us to do some of those derivations. Some of the time you might have noticed or some of the time you might not have noticed, but we have done, I think, many derivations. So, uh, or deduce those uh, equations. So it's also a mini derivation in one sense. So, yeah, in this chapter, whatever we've done till now is all derivations. So you just have to apply those in the formulas wherever applicable and then get the uh, you know, required results. However, um, in these uh, chapters, it's not like you know you're uh, taking the history of physics. Uh, it's just about by hiding the formula. Most of the time, people do by heart. But uh, it's all again, as I said, if you remember two or three formulas uh, that we've calculated, then uh, it's 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 easy for one to just remember, you know, um, or you know, you can just apply. Uh, the values of M1 and M2 or V1 and v, V1i, V1f uh, or V2i or V2f and then get the uh, you know, required results. So now to the rocket system, uh, the rocket science. So the rocket system, uh, you know, one can, uh, I mean, it's easy for one to say that uh, you know, the rocket uh, is a body, uh, you know, that, that uh, that actually obeys Newton's third law as well as the uh, you know the momentum is conserved. The mo it, uh, it acts, it works according to the principle of momentum. However, sorry, linear momentum in one sense. Uh, however, people do forget to say that uh, 
or people do forget to notice when the rocket is at the launch pad almost 90% of the mass of the rocket is nothing but rocket fuel so rocket fuel can again be two types the chemical rockets as well as uh, the uh, well, liquid rockets the chemical rockets are again polluting and uh, the liquid rockets but chemical rockets is highly efficient that's what they say and uh, liquid rockets liquid hydrogen and oxygen liquid hydrogen is yeah of course very difficult to produce but liquid hydrogen and uh, liquid oxygen uh, being a liquid rocket uh, you know in one sense the whatever after the combustion takes after the combustion whatever you get is liquid water it is not served for the chemical rockets well anyway so these are the type of uh, propellants that you use to propel the rocket uh, from the earth to the whatever space or moon or mars or or any alien planet or any uh, any you know like um, well satellites if you want to put satellites if you want to put uh, you know launch satellites not put satellites sorry launch satellites to the orbit and so on sounds unscientific anyway so but the first important thing one has to remember is that uh, the rocket uh, the mass of the rocket varies because as the rocket takes off or is being launched after the launch the fuel is converted into a thrust so the thrust is what is powering the rocket to go up so um, it's very important for us to consider uh, you know till now whatever we did uh, we did uh, you know the problems the uh, you know the relations that we found out the the, the derivations that we did all said that the rocket I mean the mass was constant in all of these derivations and problems but now for the first time we are uh, up to something wherein the mass changes you know almost the, you know we'll just find out whether it's constant or some but most of the time it's not constant for an ideal rocket however uh, you know the m at the end of its journey uh, you know the, the, the rocket will of course will have no fuel it will have only the payload payload can be a satellite or a human being or whatever okay whatever NASA or ISRO wants to put it anyway so so mass of the rocket varies with time so we shall just draw, draw some diagrams here before we just go so let the mass of the rocket be m this is the direction of velocity of the rocket so after the launch what happens is uh, you, know, you get the thrust here and, you know, mass being converted dm is uh, a fraction of mass of the rocket that is being converted into thrust so m is equal to, so here this is m again so u here is the relative velocity of the rocket with respect to an inertial frame okay since the rocket is always accelerating it's not inertial frame right? so it's an accelerating frame and hence uh, uh, not inertial so as I said pi for a rocket is equal to pf so the momentum of the rocket is conserved okay so at the end of certain time interval dt say okay dt is a time interval at the end of this time interval using this equation mv is what is the initial velocity of the rocket minus dm times u u again is the relative velocity of the rocket with respect to the uh, inertial frame and dm is the part of the mass of the rocket that is being converted into thrust okay plus m plus dm e plus d, d so v is the velocity of the rocket and uh, m plus dm is the total mass of the rocket again so um, Robert now we know that v relative is equal to v relate v velocity of the rocket relative to the products plus uh, velocity of the products relative to an inertial frame so 
So the equation that we get is V plus BV is equal to V relative plus plus U. Right? This is rela uh, rel I mean like the velocity of the product with respect to the uh, the rocket uh, sorry, the nearest of frame, and this is the velocity of the rocket with respect to the products. So, hence, sorry, so the velocity of the rocket with respect to the products, and hence, that gives you the v, uh, v relative, uh, so minus Vm V relative is equal to M D. So you just take this equation and this equation. You just um, substitute or for each other. Then you get this equation. Now minus dm by d p to v relative is equal to m times d v. So here, this is a very, very important formula. Why? Let me tell you. Actually, accidentally, what we have done is we have calculated the thrust of the rocket by, you know, the main aim of this, uh, you know, derivation in one sense was to calculate the acceleration of the rocket. Okay. So here, what you get is the mass times dv by dt. Here, dv. Again, by dt is nothing but the acceleration. So force is equal to dm minus dm by dt times v relative. So that is the force of the rocket. So here, uh, force uh, you know applied by the rocket, or you know we, we shall calculate that later. However, or you know the thrust or the force with which the rocket moves up is nothing but the thrust. So the thrust is this. This is nothing but the force that we have discussed here. Is nothing but the thrust of the rocket. So yeah, that's pretty simple, eh? So F thrust is nothing but the thrust of the rocket that, that propels the rocket upwards. And since the thrust is in the direction opposite to that of the motion of the rocket, we get minus dm by dt. The uh, you know the variation of the mass with respect to time. So again, into V relative velocity of the rocket. So, uh, so one can as well, you know, write this entire term as uh, R, right? So the rate at which the rocket loses its mass, so then F can be written as F is equal to R V relative. Right, we are relative. So anyway, so that can be written as such. So it's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, derivation that we did now. So the rocket science, uh, at the end of the day, is not at all rocket science. Uh, it's quite simple if you just understand, uh, you know, how to do the stuff. So again, now you should calculate the, the change uh, in velocity of the rocket. Now, so dv can be written as v relative into dm by by m. And we have a minus sign for this. So now, if you integrate both the sides with vi and uh, vf times uh, dv is equal to minus uh, v later times uh, dm by m vf. Right, so, so then what I get is uh, delta V is equal to minus V relative times ln MF by 
ln or ln that I have written here is a natural logarithm of mf by mi. So this is the change in velocity. Okay. Formula to find the change in velocity of the rocket at any instant. So both the equation, the thrust equation that we did, and this, the delta v is equal to minus v relative ln mf by mi holds good for rocket at any instant of time during its motion. Okay. So I think this concludes our uh, our lecture on. Uh, on the collisions and the effects of the collisions. So, although all the collisions in the world are not, I mean, ninety percent or more, ninety percent or more collisions in the world are not elastic, but we still make as a, uh, you know, a, a very good assumption that the the collisions are well elastic and we shall solve so many things. So these equations are what the rocket scientists at ISRO and NASA use to send the rocket up. So you need to calculate the mass of the rocket fuel that has to be put in and uh, at every stage you know um, after one stage you know basically the rockets are three staged uh, in today time uh, as of today you know so multi-stage rockets are better efficient because as soon as you lose the mass, the amount of fuel you need for the next leg of journey becomes lesser. So uh, the thing is you are not carrying more dead weight to the space and uh, what what this happens, I mean what this causes is that there are a lot of space junk in space. It's very difficult to launch satellites safely today because of these space junks. And when initially the space mission started, uh, you know, these uh, rockets which are bulky and cal uh, carried a lot of dead weight, you know, all that uh, empty uh, fuel tanks and stuff were dumped in space and it's revolving around the earth in orbits just like the satellites. And while launching a new satellite, uh, any of these, uh, you know, objects can come into, uh, you know, in the way of uh, your launch uh, or your rocket or your satellite and uh, totally destroy the satellite in, and uh, you know all the money that you invest into that will be uh, well, of no use. So uh, if you can remember when Ch Mangalyan, you know the Mars mission of ISRO was launched, you could hear uh, the uh, you know the, the person sitting at the ISRO, the head of the ISRO uh, the mission head was uh, you know continuously speaking in the mm, you know for everyone the audience uh, and he was telling that uh, you know the biggest challenge of r launching rocket is not uh, getting the rocket out of this earth into the upper atmosphere it's the easy part today it's the easy part but you now it was very difficult when uh, the rockets were first invented so the rockets was, uh, you know, invented for the, you know, well, both in U.S. and Russia at the same time. Uh, Soviet Union is what it was called back then. However, we shall not go back to uh, that now. But today, since we are in a modern day, so uh, you know, the rockets. Uh, it's easy to take off the ro take off in a rocket, but it is very difficult for you to reach. Uh, for, uh, you know, into reach the orbit safely from the upper atmosphere. So the upper atmosphere possess more threat because of our own space junks. So, uh, but eventually the space junks do fall off into the Earth's atmosphere because even though you are in orbit, you are still constantly accelerating towards the center of Earth. But may not be. Uh, I mean, but you are still in the Earth's gravitational influence. You are accelerating towards the center of Earth at some acceleration. But since the velocity, the orbital velocity will be uh, more than 17,000 miles an hour, so it's it's a big, huge velocity. Uh, so this this enables one to re remain in the orbit for a long time. Okay, and the thrusters are used, the International Space Station, and all these things work in in that particular way. 
but generally everything is attracted to a center of earth and satellites are no exemption. However, there is an orbit uh, called as the geo stationary orbit wherein the GPS and uh, communication satellites are being launched. Uh, so geostationary orbit is an orbit wherein uh, you know the, the satellite uh, will rotate with the earth. So uh, for even for the satellite uh, one day is equal to 24 hours. However with low earth orbits LEO is around 600 kilometers from the surface of the earth uh, where the Hubble is launched. Hubble is being uh, sorry, uh, you know, is, is revoluting around the Earth in the orbit, the Hubble's orbit is a low Earth orbit. So in this case, uh, you know, the, what, uh, the, you know, one day for Hubble is much, much, much less than 24 hours. So it's very, very less, maybe 90 to 90 minutes or 100 minutes, that's, that is what is one day or, or just more than three hours is one day night cycle. So, uh, so this is all about uh, the chapter, the collisions and energies and this, the conservations are, are over in one dimensional motion, two dimensional motion and three dimensional motion and where uh, and we have also discussed in various different cases uh, on how the object uh, behaves. So this is uh, this is all I have. Uh, from next lecture, we'll be discussing about uh, the rotational motion. Uh, again, as I said, uh, it doesn't uh, occupy a big part in the history. Of course, it's very important uh, for one to know. Uh, but it's all about you know remembering the formulas, uh, and uh, and we shall, however, do uh, two or three uh, derivations in in the rotational motion. So I again thank you for watching, it's goodbye from me until next time.